Lipsy at GE Energy Consulting in Schenectady, New York. Welcome to our monthly webinar series. For those of you not familiar with UVIG, I'd like to give you a brief introduction. We're a membership-based, not-for-profit organization providing our members with credible information and resources for renewable energy decisions, peer-to-peer -peer networking, knowledge sharing, and professional educational experiences. We just finished our fall technical workshop in Nashville, and our next activity will be the spring technical workshop in Tucson on March 13th to 15th, 2018. And you're certainly all welcome and invited to attend that one. There's really nothing else quite like it anywhere. And if you're new to UVIG, I strongly encourage you to follow up with us if you like what you hear, and I certainly don't think you'll be sorry if you do. Today's session covers a popular, important, and growing subject regarding variable generation, power plant modeling, and uh, validation. Our speakers will talk about the state of the art for wind and solar plant modeling, as well as how those models are tuned to reflect the as-built performance of installed equipment. We'll also cover some of the technical regulatory requirements in North America on the subject as well. Okay, before we get started, just a few logistical matters. Uh, first, all phone lines are muted during the session. Also, today's session is going to be recorded and uh, an email will go out uh, once the presentations and audio files have been posted. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, all the attendees to please use the Q&A box in the WebEx to submit any questions you might have. And we'll save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end to answer some of those questions. And then we'll plan to wrap up right around the hour. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce both of our expert speakers for today, Bob Zavadel with Enernex and Ryan Quint with NERC. I've known Bob and Ryan for many years, and they are both true thought leaders in our industry and have a great deal of expertise and insight to share on this and, and quite frankly, many other subjects. It's certainly a privilege and a pleasure to have them with us today. So Bob Zavadil is the Executive Vice President of the Internex Corporation and is a co-founder of Internex. He's responsible for developing and overseeing the company's power system engineering consulting business. He has worked on electric power system issues for wind generation for over 25 years. His clients include wind turbine designers and manufacturers, project developers and operators, transmission service providers and ISOs and research and development organizations, uh, including NREL and EPRI. From 1989 to the summer of 2003, Bob served in various consulting and product development capabilities for Electrotech Concepts and its parent company, WPT. Bob began his career in the electric power industry back in 1982 as a special studies engineer in the Transmission and Distribution Engineering Division of Nebraska Public Power District. He's a member of IEEE Power and Energy and uh, as well as power electronics and industrial application societies. And he serves as the vice chair of the IEEE PES Wind and Solar Power Coordinating Committee. I'd also like to in introduce Ryan Quint. Dr. Ryan Quint is the senior manager of advanced analytics and modeling at the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. His group at NERC supports the utility industry in understanding emerging reliability issues and the changing bulk power system performance through advanced system analysis, modeling, modeling improvements, and collaboration with stakeholders. Ryan coordinates numerous NERC technical groups focused on power system stability, transmission planning, interconnection-wide modeling, dynamic load modeling, power plant verification and testing, inverter-based resources, and synchrophasers, and I guess in a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> Ryan also worked at Dominion Virginia Power, at Bonneville Power Administration, and he received his PhD from Virginia Tech as a registered professional engineer in the state of Virginia. So it's certainly a pleasure to have uh, both Bob and Ryan with us today. We'll start with Bob and then hand it over to Ryan after his talk. So Bob, please take it away. <clears throat> All right. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, since we're a little tight for time, I'm going to try to f fly through this because, as many of you probably realize, the real action here uh, with regard to VG plant modeling is now squarely in the NERC court, and um, uh, we need to uh, um, make sure we have time to listen carefully to what Ryan has to say. So I'm going to start a little bit at the beginning and talk about the <clears throat> the, the specific models that are under consideration here. Uh, we understand that the adequate simulation models are indispensable for engineering the, the grid reliability, operational security, um, addressing the impact of network changes, um, uh, new connections to the network, and, and thus forth. 
Um, and that's the way things have been done <clears throat> essentially since the era of the computer platforms out there. Now, with regard to uh, VG plant and, and other technology, uh, we want to uh, narrow down what we're talking about here. The, the focus of, of this webinar is really the, the models that we require for grid studies. So there are some, some caveats and, and narrowing of the scope to come with that. Uh, we are interested in, in the behavior <clears throat> of the network and all the connected um, entities under a range of steady state conditions around um, nominal voltages and nominal frequency. And then the behavior of the system um, under, you know, large signal disturbances that result in um, substantially off nominal voltages or frequency. Now, <clears throat> the modeling that we're talking about here has been enshrined in the um, NERC standards for some time and, and, and recently updated. And then there's been some further discussions on where we need to go in the future, especially in light of the changing uh, generation fleet across the U.S. interconnection. So the context is not models generally, but positive sequence models that we map to the major planning platforms, PSSE, PSLF, PowerWorld, um, covers the interconnections in the U.S. We're talking about the behavior of essentially renewable plants um, under defined conditions. So large signal, short duration variations of voltage and or frequency, and events of BES origin, not events internal to a particular plant or driven by, say, wind or changes in um, solar or radiance. Um, when we look at BG plants relative to conventional generators, a couple of things pop out uh, pretty quickly. <clears throat> in conventional plants, we have one or maybe a few uh, very large synchronous machines uh, with well-characterized excitation systems and governors. Um, and, and well-known synchronous machines. Uh, with regard to renewable plants, we have a very large number of relatively exotic uh, machines, if you want to call them that, and then lots of other stuff to essentially <clears throat> connect the individual sources of renewable generation to some uh, delivery point to the grid. Um, it's worth noting here that in the context of validation, what we're primarily interested in from the bulk system perspective is the behavior of the plant, which would include all the turbines or all the inverters and the influence of all the intervening um, medium voltage um, infrastructure and other equipment, say for reactive compensation that may be present. So <clears throat> the technologies themselves initially pose some big challenges because uh, there simply weren't the pieces and parts in the dynamic model libraries in either PSSE or PSLF to represent the, uh, the, the technologies that were being employed for renewable energy conversion. Uh, we're talking about induction machines or possibly even um, permanent magnet synchronous generators, those sorts of things, with <clears throat> a lot of um, control um, as influenced by static power conversion technology, modern standard um, power conversion technology. Um, unlike maybe what as utility engineers we were more familiar with in terms of um, um, six pulse rectifiers and you know HVDC building blocks. And then um, <clears throat> as the scale of the plants grew, um, so did the required infrastructure to, uh, to tie everything together. And the influence on the terminal behavior um, was found to be in some cases pretty substantial. So when we talk about a bulk renewable plant, there's a lot of pieces and parts that need to be represented or considered in some way that we don't have to worry about with conventional plants. And um, you know that includes the reactive compensation that might be available from the turbines or the inverters themselves. Uh, additional reactive compensation we would deploy through the plant uh, to manage vol voltage profiles at medium voltage. Uh, additional reactive compensation at the at the interconnecting substation, uh, possibly to, to help us meet <clears throat> the requirements of interconnection imposed through the grid code. And then the influence of the um, medium voltage infrastructure uh, in terms of reactive losses and the influence on the voltage profile. Fortunately, these days we don't deal with um, too much in a wind plant anyway, overhead collector. Uh, but back in the day, that was a, a pretty significant challenge with regard to managing voltage within the uh, plant itself and then meeting 
<clears throat> requirements at the point of interconnection for a reactive range. So a, a brief and, and kind of approximate history. On the right-hand side, you see the uh, growth in the installed capacity of, of <clears throat> bulk wind on the top and then um, all solar on the bottom. Um, so we're, you know, 80 plus gigawatts of wind right now, 15 gigawatts of uh, solar total, of which quite a bit of that is actually bulk connected. Uh, prior to 2000, wind was just beginning to be developed outside of California, specifically Texas, Minnesota, um, some other places in the Great Plains. Uh, it certainly was a novelty. Uh, studies were required to interconnect these plants. We really didn't have models, but because of the size of the plants and the amount of installed capacity at the time, there was not a whole bunch of concern uh, for the grid. Um, you know, we, we were able to use engineering judgment to convince ourselves that it wasn't an issue. So we, we fast forward a few years and um, <clears throat> back at the, the earliest part of the century, the OEMs uh, began to realize that, that models were going to be critical for continued growth of the industry. Um, there's a, you know, a lot of long stories as to how that realization came to be. But the vendors responded by developing custom models of their equipment for the uh, transmission planning platforms, TFSE and PSLF primarily. And uh, there weren't any requirements <clears throat> against which these models were created. So it was sort of left up to the uh, desires of the vendor as to what was included, what wasn't included, and that sort of thing. So we did have some models that we could use for studies, but it was kind of all over the map with regard to the the um, you know relatively structured <clears throat> transmission planning processes that that we have today. Um, in 2005 or thereabouts, uh, the folks on the uh, on the grid side began to realize that a new direction was needed if this were to continue. Uh, first of all, the custom models were problematic in that they were sometimes required NDAs and all that kind of stuff. And in the construction of a planning case. Um, you know, we can't have a stack of, um, you know, 200 individual NDAs to sign before you could have access to that planning model. So the whole notion of treating it like conventional generation was sort of um, conceived by folks in the WECC in that we needed to work towards generic representations for the range of, uh, at that time it was wind turbine uh, technologies that were, that were on the market and being uh, built into projects. So WEC led this initiative. I'll have a little bit to say about that, but that's really the, uh, the, the starting point for where we're at today with regard to modeling. Um, a few years later, it was recognized that the first crack at those models uh, was good and, and allowed us to make some incremental progress, but there were improvements that were needed. Um, this was borne out by you know, our growing experience in the field and, and uh, measurements and understanding of of how these plants actually behaved um, relative to maybe what we thought going in. Also about that time, bulk solar PV was coming strongly onto the radar and that needed to be dealt with, um, which led to a second generation of generic models that are, that are much improved and, and really are the standard now uh, in terms of the, the planning tools we use for <clears throat> the bulk grid. Um, that's not to say that there still aren't issues and that there isn't a lot of work to do, but it um, would be said that, you know, the, the regional entities and the RTOs in the U.S. have, you know, uniformly adopted the generic modeling approach as, as a requirement for representing uh, VG plants in uh, current and, excuse me, in current and uh, future planning cases. Of most significance is really how NERC has has come to play a large role in this. Uh, going back uh, 10 years ago, there was the uh, um, Integrating Variable Generation Task Force, which led to the Essential Reliability Services Task Force, ER, ERSTF, uh, that began to explore how the changing generation fleet across the U.S. interconnections uh, would potentially uh, change certain of the, the reliability issues that are, <clears throat> are are every day what we try to uh, what we try to protect, and that's led further to a uh, task force on inverter-based generation. And you'll hear some of those things from Ryan here in just a couple of minutes. So where we're at with regard to this 
standard generic models. Um, because of the range of energy conversion technologies employed, it wasn't possible to uh, boil this down like we have for conventional generators. So we ended up with essentially four types of, of generator topologies uh, for wind initially. Um, you know, of these four, actually only the last two, type three and type four, are relevant today, although there is a substantial uh, you know, fleet in the ground, they have type one and type two turbines, so they need to be uh, represented in the planning cases. Um, as solar, <clears throat> as solar came on, bulk solar, it was recognized that the type four wind turbine topology, which considered a full converter interface where the, the generator, the electrical machine was completely isolated from <clears throat> the grid through the power converter, would be a good basis upon which to build for the, the uh, completely inverter-based technologies. And um, so that's been picked up in what <clears throat> has, has come out of WEC and really has become the standard. And so just a little more detail on the timeline. Um, the second generation of models was completed in late 2013 and, and WEC put their stamp on it in early 2014. And I think other RTOs have have made similar moves in that um, if you're going to build a renewable plant, uh, the model David that you need to submit as part of your interconnection request will conform to the various generic model structures. A um, couple things about specifications for the WEC generic models that are really important. Um, and I'm not gonna go over all this, just the bolded pieces. Um, the, the fact that these models are non-proprietary and accessible uh, without NDAs or other restrictions is, is critical to the whole notion behind generic models. Further, these models were developed to represent the behavior of the variable generation plant in response to grid disturbances, not uh, renewable fuel disturbances. Okay, so there's an assumption for these models that the uh, solar <laughs> radiation or the average wind speed across the plant is essentially constant over the time frame of the simulation, which may or may not be a good assumption uh, as we're starting to find as we move into validation, but that's uh, a separate subject. And that the accuracy of the generic models, uh, I think it uh, overall needs to be uh, verified, okay? And then understand that um, the models are positive sequence only. Uh, most of the real events we see on the system are unbalanced. So there's a, uh, there's a uh, step in translation between the model domain and the real world that needs to be considered. And in my opinion, we're just kind of getting, getting started on that. Um, the guidance from the manufacturers is critical, um, if only because uh, there's been a lot of variations and permutations of the product that they send out the door, either in response to uh, uh, desire to improve performance, uh, you know, energy production, or in response to uh, grid codes that have evolved over the years. So technical challenges remain, and, and unfortunately in this hour, we aren't gonna go through and tune up any model parameters. But <clears throat> one thing to keep in mind is that we're still faced with the fundamental challenge that we're representing a plant that potentially incorporates dozens or even hundreds of small individual machines uh, into something that lives in the planning case as an equivalent generator or two. Um, we've not been doing that for this long, so that can be a complicating factor, even in terms of steady state performance. Um, you know, understanding what the plant D curve looks like um, can, be, can be challenging with this substantial medium voltage infrastructure. Uh, the D curve for a synchronous generator is generally something you would get almost directly from the manufacturer, whereas in the case of renewable plants, um, there's a little more work to do before we get there. Um, a, a short list here, but really a longer list of other needs. Um, models for renewable plants can be more complicated, much more complicated than conventional plants, and they're certainly less familiar. So as an industry, and I think you know, Ryan will maybe allude to this, there's a learning curve that we're still on. Um, you know, the understanding of how to employ these models, how to uh, develop parameters, assistance from vendors or other projects uh, is, is not sort of uniformly uh, distributed across the U.S. So 
um, this is going to be a, uh, a challenge going forward. And then uh, ultimately, we, we still need to understand whether these models um, are adequate for our operational security planning purposes. And that really gets to the, the validation uh, piece. Um, you know, is it real or is it Memorex? Uh, we've got a model that, um, in the case of conventional generators, we have reason to believe, uh, you know, represent <clears throat> a range of conditions, um, a, a range of performance that's pretty good with regard to, um, you know, an actual, an actual facility. Um, that question is, is uh, much less answered with regard to renewable plants. The scale and scope is a, is a little bit daunting in that, you know, there are probably more than 500 uh, bulk connected renewable plants in the ground. And if we talk about plant model validation, it's not a matter of whether GE has a good model for their turbine. It's have I taken that model and constructed uh, the appropriate representation for one of those 500 plants that's in the ground. So um, a, a, a big amount of work going forward. And I'm going to sort of end here when we talk about <clears throat> renewable plant model validation um, for significant grid disturbances. So I'm talking about large signal where the voltage, rather than maybe changing a few percent um, in response to turning on or turning off a, a bulk system capacitor bank, where it might change by 25, 30, 40%. Uh, so you get you know, deeply into the control operation of the plant and potentially other equipment there like um, static bar compensators and whatnot. So you know, in terms of validating the entire plant from the outside, uh, there's some ways to approach it. This is kind of a cartoon graph. Uh, we can't do stage fault testing anymore, obviously. Um, so it appears to me, and I've been kind of carrying this flag for maybe too long now, that monitoring at the point of interconnection with PMUs, digital fault recorders, whatever, is likely the best chance to really validate a plant model um, with, with difficulty, of course, um, because the events that we experience aren't going to be neat and tidy, uh, probably aren't going to be balanced. And so there's going to be a lot of, you know, technical work to even utilize that data. At the same time, however, it's a real grid disturbance, and we need to make sure that what we're representing in the planning models um, comports uh, reasonably well to the behavior of an actual plant. So um, I think I'm going to stop there and, and pass it over to Ryan, um, and then uh, we'll take questions later. Let's see. It's coming to you, Ryan. I'm going to pass the ball. Oh, All right. Well, uh, Bob Bob's passing over the. I, I oh, that's right. To that's Jason. Jason. <laughs> I'll pass it. Oh, Jason's got to pass it. I'm sorry. Yeah, so while uh, while Jason passing me the ball, uh, just to give a brief introduction, you know, I, I really enjoy listening to Bob kind of talk about the the history and how we got to where we are, and I like seeing those uh, you know trend graphs that show the solar and wind penetration, particularly on the BPS. So again, we're talking about bulk grid connected resources. Uh, it's just an exciting time that we live in, 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 a, in, a, in a totally evolving grid. And so we hear you know the concepts of changing resource mix, things like that. But it's an entirely different mindset that we live in today, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But you know, we're used to uh, you know the, the conventional, so the, the synchronous machine fleet, and now we live in a world that's not so controlled by uh, physics or physical limitations of equipment anymore. It's driven by uh, algorithm control algorithms and and very fast inherent response times from these inverter-based resources, and so. It's not so much of uh, you know fixing reliability risks or fixing problems. It's about utilizing to the best extent possible the given technologies that we have today. And uh, one of the things I keep advocating, and I know many at NERC are advocating, is that we just need to keep up with the technology. Uh, things are evolving. Grid codes around the world are evolving. NERC reliability standards will need to evolve. Our models and modeling practices need to evolve, uh, evolve as well. And so, you know, it really is just exciting. So what I'm going to talk about briefly today 
is, uh, you know, the modeling and the validation aspects, particularly of inverter-based resources, so predominantly Type 3 and 4, uh, wind and solar PV. And again, this is bulk grid connected resources. We're not necessarily talking about uh, distribution connected resources. So just to give a disclaimer up front, you know, the usual disclaimer that I work on the reliability side of the shop. So this will be a more technical presentation, not related to compliance. If there are any compliance questions uh, or you're looking for compliance guidance, you can get in touch with the NERC compliance department directly. Uh, or feel free to reach out to me and I can put you in touch with the right folks. I will touch on a number of, of standards and I think it's important to put that paradigm, you know, that box around what we're talking about. I'm going to mix a little bit of the inverter-based resource performance characteristics with the models, but the focus here really obviously is the, the modeling aspects. And so I've, I've shown this figure multiple times, uh, many of the have probably seen it, but uh, what we're really living in is the mod 32 paradigm, so that's sort of the outer box, which is the development of the interconnection wide cases, uh, the base cases. And so that's a, a, a culmination of all the individual component models out there, everything from loads to shunt capacitors to generators uh, to HVDC, how you set up transfers, how you set up the loads, that's all part of the mod 32 realm. But really when it comes down to what we're talking about today, it's really the plant modeling, which is mod. 25, mod 26, and mod 27. So 25 is the generator reactive capability. So a testing which is proving, you know, can I get to my uh, Pmax, Qmax, Qmin, uh, Pmin values and, and demonstrating that capability via test. Mod 26 and mod 27 are the dynamic model validation or model verification standards where uh, you go into the plant and you perform a verification of some, so, some sort and you provide sort of a report that, you know, the model matches, reasonably matches a, what's actually installed out there in the field. So mod 26 and 27 is, is specifically where we'll be focusing a lot in this conversation. Mod 33 is, again, kind of, it goes hand in hand with mod 32. It's the system-wide model of validation that the planning coordinators perform. So they'll go create, a, you know, large grid disturbance happens. They're going to go try to recreate that grid disturbance using their interconnection-wide models and maybe some additional components added for their unique system. Uh, but that's really built off of the Mod32 models. And so it's a, kind of the validation piece from a systems perspective, while Mod26 and Mod27 are uh, more component or individual plant uh, perspectives. So just to give a little bit of background on the applicability, this slide is mainly for reference. Uh, I'm sure these slides will be posted, but uh, you have the effective dates of the various standards listed there on the right. Uh, mod 20, mod 32, for example, is in full force. Mod 26 and 27 uh, have an impending uh, uh, effective date for requirement two, which is the actual verification testing. Uh, so the generator owners are, you know, actively working to make sure they have their models validated, and then obviously there's an implementation plan associated with each of these. Uh, the, the numbers listed there in red are, are pretty important from an inverter-based resource standpoint that any BES connected resource is subject to the NERC reliability standards with the applicability applied for various standards like you'll see here. So per interconnection, there's a size threshold for the dynamic model verification. Um, 100 MBA in the Eastern and Quebec interconnection, 75 in the Western interconnection and the Texas interconnection uh, or ERCOT footprint. And so it's, it's important just to note that these verification standards apply to any resource and, and renewables or inverter-based resources are part of that uh, as long as they meet that size criteria on an aggregate basis. And so they'll be a BES resource and then they'll have to meet uh, the modeling requirements there. The implementation plans, like I mentioned, they're listed there. I'm going to kind of skim past this, but it'll be there for reference. So the first thing that I want to touch on is, is just the power flow representation. I know we're mainly talking about dynamics. and The dynamic models get so much attention, yet we seem to overlook the power flow models. And so I think some guidance is needed, and we're working on this at the NERC level, to provide some guidance on, you know, accurate power flow modeling. And you know, I, I think we're kind of separated as an industry and we need to come back into alignment. If I pick up a, a Eastern interconnection, Western interconnection, you know, I don't care what interconnection it is, there's going to be a handful of models of, uh, you know, 100 megawatt wind plants modeled with just a generator connected to a 230 kV bus, not even with a you know, step-down transformer in some cases. We've seen some crazy things get into these base cases. And so we're not on the same playing field of just even power flow representation. 
So I think once we get there, I think the next step that we need uh, and we'll be advocating is more advanced intelligence built into the power flow model. So when a planner is redispatching the wind fleet or the solar fleet, uh, for example, wind type two machines, uh, you've got to go in there and you've got to adjust all the shunt caps every time you make a change to make sure you get reasonable voltage profiles. And when you're doing large scale dispatch changes, it, it can kind of creep up on you unexpectedly and you end up spending a lot of time with initialization problems that you just, you know, you just forget. So you've got to go back and you've got to spend quite a bit of time fixing the voltage profile, making sure you get all those initialization errors out. Really, that should all be done automatically in the world we live in today. If I've got me mechanically switched shunt caps in the plant, I should be able to kind of define a plant level controller that knows that I have this wind, this equivalent wind plant mon you know, linked to these mechanically switched caps or this SVC or STATCOM and then should know what type of control strategy am I in Am I in power factor mode? And if so, at what power factor? Am I in automatic voltage control? And what's my power factor range? And maybe be able to identify or define a curve, kind of like some tools allow us to define a D curve. So those are the things we're going to be advocating. We'd like to see advancements in the power flow tools to be able to keep up with the technology, to ease off the burden of the planners that have to spend a lot of time working on the models instead of actually planning the system. So with that, and then how you kind of link that to the dynamics, I've just got a couple of examples here, and this is more thought-provoking and not necessarily providing guidance here, but you pick up a base case off the shelf and, and you initialize that case and you get a whole bunch of errors and you can see them listed here. Um, plants, you know, some examples are units operating 80% of its uh, active power output, yet it's exceeding its maximum real current command or real current value. So, you know, when you're a planner, you're wondering, well, why? I've got unit at 80% of its Pmax value in the power flow base case, yet when I initialize it, it's causing me all types of problems. Uh, another good example is wind dispatched in the case at less than 5%, and so it's, it's throwing some alarms in there. Well, why are you dispatching wind at less than 5% in the case? Is there a reason? Maybe there is a reason, um, but that seems like a strange operating point to pick up a case off the shelf and, and see that. Down below are some other examples. Units dispatched within 20% you know, of its Qmax Qmin values, yet it's throwing an error saying it's exceeding its maximum reactive capability. So there's there's issues here, and I think it's, it's associated with you know base values and maybe transitioning from uh, the dynamics models into the power flow, power flow realm. And so there's just more work to be done to make sure we have full alignment. So when when we're making changes in the cases and, and getting models making sure that these models match across the board, making that as easy as possible for the generator owner as well as the planner who's actually running the studies. So related to Mod 2627, uh, Bob's been harping for years and, and I really appreciate it, the difference between small disturbance and large disturbance. And it really wasn't until the recent task force that NERC kicked off uh, that I'm helping coordinate really set in the difference between these two. And so I'll kind of give my perspectives here. So we have, that can, you know, you go into a test and you perform what we call bump tests or speed reference step test, voltage reference step test in a synchronous machine, and it's very similar in a, in a renewable plant. You'll go in and perform a, maybe a cap switching test or you'll play in a voltage reference step or you'll play in a grid frequency and sort of fool the plant into thinking an under frequency or over frequency event. And you'll watch the plant respond really nicely and you'll get these great matches that we see here on the, on the left-hand side on the bottom plot, you'll see a reactive powers matching quite well. Uh, step tests on the right, you see a pretty excellent match. Uh, and the, and the uh, manufacturers and the generator owners are providing reports that, that show these types of responses. And so, we're, you know, we're, we're feeling comfortable that the model accurately represents reality. Uh, that's all great around that operating point where you're making small, you know, less than 5% change in voltage reference or small changes in grid frequency and you're watching the plant, you know, controls as a whole respond. But when you get into the more severe large disturbance uh, events, it's a challenge and, and we're, we're quickly realizing that the models, you know, it's, it's hard to test. It's nearly impossible to test these types of things. Like like Bob said, we don't go out and apply a, a fault onto the grid to, to do model verification all the time. but uh, when, when faults do occur, it gives a great opportunity for us to look, did the plant at a large scale, large disturbance type of response match uh, the model performance? And what we're seeing is a lot of times it's not. And so I think we have a lot more work to do. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a modeling deficiency. Uh, it may just be a communication deficiency in understanding 
uh, how these plants are actually behaving out there. So momentary cessation is, is one that, that kind of hit us in the face uh, quite uh, literally, actually. We, we've had a number of grid disturbances and we're seeing the use of momentary cessation, uh, which is the ceasing energization of current into the grid uh, by these types of resources, particularly in the, the solar world. Uh, it really grew up in the IEEE 1547, this concept of momentary cessation and ceasing energization under certain conditions. That's great for the distribution, but it's, it's unfortunately crept up into the transmission grid, and now we have a lot of resources out there today that use momentary cessation and may not necessarily have the capability to easily fix that uh, control strategy uh, without a substantial investment. And so when you pick up a base case and you apply a fault, you don't see any momentary cessation in, in the models that we get today. Yet there are areas prone, you know, studies have shown upwards of 10,000 megawatts of, uh, that could go into momentary cessation. And typically this was intended to be a very fast, you know, on-fault condition. I will cease energization. I may have uh, trouble maintaining synchronism with, with the grid. And so I have various reasons why I need to go into momentary cessation. And then I'll come back as soon as voltage returns in say a cycle or two cycles. And some of the existing PAX technologies we've been told you know, do similar type of control strategies. But the momentary cessation seems to have crept and, and it, there are examples where momentary cessation is taking tens of seconds to return back to full output, which really is non-ideal and pretty much non-acceptable performance from a dynamic standpoint and something that we need to keep up with. We need to you know, evolve in terms of uh, standards, but also in terms of models and modeling practices. And so the tools, we need to make sure that they have the capability and the models have the ability to model this fairly easily fairly accurately, and, and I think this is going to be a, something that we're going to seek improvement on in the next generation of models. Like I mentioned, the, the various models, this REGCA, second generation renewable model that uh, Bob was mentioning. So we're looking at how do we accurately model you know, momentary cessation, for example, and what are we doing about it? So we'll have some guidance coming out to the industry on that shortly. Here's just a good example of, of momentary cessation, what it looks like. You have essentially blips in the voltage. These are normally cleared fault events that are occurring, uh, fairly small voltage changes, and you've got the unit going to zero output for, you know, five seconds or however long is a second, and coming back and then kind of a slow ramp rate back up to full output. It is providing some dynamic uh, reactive support, so that is good, but this type of performance is, is, I would say, fairly abnormal when you look at it from a synchronous machine standpoint that a voltage of 0.96 would cause you to go to zero active power output uh, that's, you know, to be honest, not looked kindly by the, you know, regulatory bodies to say, are, are you really providing an essential reliability service of, vol you know, automatic voltage control, maintaining your active power output during small blips and in, in grid voltage? So these are things that we're looking at and, and figuring out how to, how to get some guidance to. So the number one thing that we're doing is really maintaining constant vigilance and, and looking at grid events with a fine-tooth comb. And so really the recommendations we're making is that if you're a planner, a planning coordinator, a transmission planner, be analyzing grid events. You know, keep your eye out because some of the neatest things that we've found over the last, you know, six, seven months have, have just been from planners looking at normally cleared two and a half cycle clearing 500 kV faults and the really fascinating things that happen uh, from these inverter-based resources. A strong coordination with the GO is, is essentially man mandatory or necessary for anything to happen because you need to know what type of inverters are in that facility. How are those inverters set? Who do I contact to, to learn more about how this plant's really behaving? So we got to better understand the performance, update the models accordingly, and also bring those issues to the you know, industry forums like ERC, IEEE, uh, and UVIG, so that way we can collectively fix these things as an issue instead of having continuous you know, one-off model problems. From a generator standpoint, we're strongly advocating you know, point-on-wave oscillography records either within the plant or at the point of interconnection because we need to know what's going on at each individual inverter and then how the overall plant is behaving. And we need very high resolution data. Uh, Bob mentioned the use of PMU data. Some of these things like momentary cessation are happening in the you know, couple cycle range. So even PMU data we've seen will wash out some of the momentary cessation uh, issues that we want to see for some large disturbance uh, verification or testing. So really point on wave oscillography data is really what we're advocating. PMU data also is incredibly valuable, uh, particularly at the point of interconnection. So all types of modeling in the plant will be valuable, providing some guidance, guidance on that. 
On the left here, you can see two different events that happened about a couple minutes within each other. First event, very similar type of events, uh, one at the 230 kV, one at the 500 kV. Um, and the plants responded very differently. And note that these are one minute divots. So this is a long period of time for my dynamics realm. You know, our dynamic models are half of a division here uh, in terms of their, you know, time frame in which we use those models. But ca you can see here capturing momentary cessation. This plant, for example, went near zero output instantaneously and came back, at least on the, that's what the lower resolution data is showing us. Others are seeing these ramped responses back over a period of minutes. Um, why and, and why are these plants performing that way is something that we're looking at very, very closely. And we're trying to understand what's the underlying issues that's causing either plants to trip, partially trip, use momentary cessation, use partial momentary cessation, and why are those not being represented in the models? Because if you apply these same faults with the models we have today, you'll see a blip and a flat line, and then a blip and a flat line. And we wouldn't be capturing any of these types of things. So we have a gap and we need to figure out how to address that gap. So what are we doing in the short term? Uh, we're, we're developing an in-run EPCL, or essentially a user-defined script, to be able to simulate momentary cessation. And we're doing this at the Inverter-Based Resource Performance Task Force at NERC. And the goal there is to really look at bookending the performance characteristics of the system. So how, how much momentary cessation could we even allow, <clears throat> regardless of what the NERC standards say? You know, where are we today? What are we doing about it? So the, the pro there is that it's flexible, customizable, uh, we can apply it to different models. We don't need uh, to change parameters provided by the GOs. But the con is it's a, it's a temporary workaround, and so it can't really be used in the typical planning models where you need to get that model from the GO and use that model. Uh, so the plan is to, you know, perform these studies, uh, be able to make recommendations to the industry, uh, learn from the use of the momentary cessation and run EPCL, and then make recommendations in the long-term improvements for maybe a third-generation renewables models. So just to close out, you know, the NERC IRPTF, or Inverter Based Resource Performance Task Force, we have a modeling simulation subgroup. It's really a group of experts, manufacturers, uh, simulation experts, transmission planners, planning coordinators, particularly in the Western interconnection. And we're going to be providing guidance in, say, Q2 2018. We also have another group looking at the model verification, so the small, small disturbance aspects. Um, providing guidance on Mod 26 and Mod 27. That'll be coming out in Q2 as well, 2018. Uh, and then just continuing to look at these, these grid events that involve inverter-based resources. So we've had a number of events, a number of reports have gone out by NERC looking at uh, you know, normally cleared 500 kV faults where thousands of megawatts of solar plants are tripping off. That's just teaching us so much every single day. We have kind of this evolving understanding of how these things work. And, and the impact that they can have on the on the BPS. So really the main ultimate recommendation, I think, through all of this is just to, to get involved. So if you're interested in the NERC IRPTF, for example, my contact information is on the next slide. But UVIG, IEEE, CGRAY, WEC uh, technical committees, these are all excellent, uh, you know, venues to, to share your experiences, but also to learn, to learn from the manufacturers, to learn from the generator owners. Uh, it's just a great opportunity to share experience, and, and I think we collectively have to move forward. It's not going to happen by any one individual group. Uh, so it's, you know, it's kind of an honor to be here to represent NERC and the IRPTF uh, and to connect with the UVIG and then also to connect with those other you know, IEEE C grade type environments. So I think with that, uh, I'll pass it back to Jason. Okay. Well, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Bob, um, for excellent presentations and your expert insights today. Um, I'd now like to open it up uh, to pick some questions from the audience. I don't see that there's any questions logged yet, so if you have any questions for Bob or Ryan today, please use the Q&A box in the WebEx uh, to, to uh, list your question, and I can read it off. Okay. So while we're waiting for folks to, uh, to list the questions, I um, hope uh, that there's uh, there's a couple of good questions uh, uh, coming out of uh, you know two very in-depth and technical uh, content uh, and, and presentations today. Uh, maybe Ryan, I'll and Bob, I'll start off with one general question uh, to get us started here. Um, you both alluded to uh, what's happening in our industry, particularly around 
the penetration of distributed energy resources. And uh, Ryan, you mentioned momentary cessation and IEEE 1547. And historically, when we talk about model validation, where we started talking about what does a power plant do? You know, Bob mentioned a lot about power plants and, and how those power plants respond in the system and how models capture that behavior adequately so that planners and operators can make valid decisions. But now we have a lot more distributed resources on the system that, that really impact the dynamic performance. And just wanted to get your opinions on where we go from here in validation to capture uh, what is the impact and behavior of all this DER coming online and, you know, you know for things like momentary cessation, for example. Um, what is being done in the industry now and, and you know, through NERC and, and others mm -hmm. uh, to capture the, the impact of this DER on the system? I'll go first, Ryan. I, I, a lot of uh, gnashing of teeth, Jason. <laughs> yeah. That, that there, there's been a lot of good discussions about the fact that historically we made assumptions about the dynamic behavior of aggregate loads, you know, uh, from a bulk delivery point. And I think what's happening is the fact that <clears throat> some of those bulk delivery points now uh, are, you know, including a fair amount of distributed generations, you know, rooftop solar PV and all that kind of stuff. So it's 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 highlighted a problem that's been around for a while. And um, I, I know folks in WAC and elsewhere are, you know, have been considering this for a while, improving the complex load models and stuff. But it's a very difficult uh, issue because, um, uh, you know, again, the dynamic behavior of these bulk delivery points is going to be different than the next one. And so how do we characterize that? And I think, you know, back last month in Nashville, uh, someone had actually said, is it really important? As if we, you know, haven't quite come to terms with, um, with whether this is really an issue or not, or whether our, you know, sort of longstanding practice is adequate. Yeah, well, yeah, that's Go ahead. Just to add, add a little bit to that. Yeah, exactly what Bob said. And, and I think we're a lot of gnashing of teeth, and I think we're still in the early stages of, of, of understanding how we're going to account for these types of resources. They're really not, you know, they may be modeled in the local area studies, uh, but when you pick up an interconnection wide model, there's, there's not much clear representation of, of DER in there, which is a concern that we're, we're maybe missing out on some of the, uh, you know, reliability issues that, that could be out there uh, from an aggregate or a system-wide standpoint. And when you're applying, you know, BPS, connect, you know, faults on the bulk power system, you know, normal planning criteria studies where you're affecting, you know, thousands of square miles of, of, of area when you apply a three-phase fault to the 500 kV system, it's affecting a lot of feeders. And so you're going to see a varying response, some differences, uh, like Bob mentioned, based on you know, load dynamics, various configuration dynamics, whatever. But a lot of the same technology is out there following the same exact standard requirements. And so any potential issues that we, we could run into, we really need to be paying attention to those. So we put out some guidance. We've got two reliability guidelines on DER modeling. I encourage folks to, to go read those, one talking mainly about power flow and how do we account for these resources in the power flow. Uh, how do we go out and get the data we need? Uh, and then we also have a second one looking at, you know, what types of dynamic models could I use to represent those plants in the dynamics realm? Uh, but even even beyond that, it's just do we have the right data we need? Uh, are we going out and collecting that data uh, as a planning planning coordinator? Do we have the capability to go get that data? And are there, like I mentioned, are there any underlying potential, you know, kind of common mode failures the way I think about them? Uh, a good example is we're running some really heavy stress condition simulations in the IRPTF simulations, and we're seeing some fairly low uh, uh, frequency response uh, under very, very high penetration current operating practices with kind of minimum spin requirements online. And so, you know, could we hit any potential issues? So not only UFLS at the 59.5 level at the bulk grid, but lower frequency levels, maybe 59.3, where we may have common mode, all inverters of the distribution connect system may trip at the 59.3 level uh, based on the current requirements out there today. And so we've got some things on our mind that, you know, kind of help us understand, you know, that this may be a, a minimum bar of reliability, but if we hit this level, you know, some, some really nasty things could occur. And so we're looking at how do we address that? How do we get on in front of it? 
but I think a lot more needs to be done in the DER space, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. There are yeah. a few thank questions you. up there. Excellent. Yes, there absolutely. There are up there, Jason, yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bob and Ryan. And uh, there are about six to eight questions that have come in, and I'd um, like to, to start addressing those. I think uh, the first round of questions really deals with uh, more generic models and uh, also open, open and publicly shared models. So let me read one of them and, uh, and see if, uh, you know, Bob and Ryan, you can address these. So the first is, can you please share your thoughts on variable generation models for stability studies? Uh, is a generic model needed for studies like eigenvalue analysis for different applications? And are these models open and public? Mm, that's a hard question. Um, I, I think right now, the, the, you know, the, the, the focus or where we sit with regard to the generic models would really be the, um, you know, time domain, uh, phaser regime um, models in PSSC and PSLF. Um, I'm not aware <clears throat> with regard to, you know, throughout industry of um, the, the eigenvalue analysis and that kind of stuff actually, uh, uh, you know, really being a, a, a target for the development of, of these models. I, I presume that there are smart folks out there that could figure out how to do it. Yeah, so from the, from the NERP perspective, I would just uh, – you know, I think it's a, it's a more cut and dry than I think most most people think, uh, at least at the NERC level, which is for the purposes of interconnection-wide modeling, you're required to provide a generic model by the Mod 32 designee. So the person that creates the cases puts the requirements in place, and one of those requirements is that their, you know, black box models are not allowed. User-defined user models may be allowed, but you've got to provide full block diagrams for everything. And so that drives people to use kind of the generic models. It's not expected that that model necessarily match every detail of the detailed model. Uh, the transmission planner planning coordinator should also be requiring a very detailed, potentially black box model so that they can benchmark the generic model against that model, prove that the two of them match, uh, and then they have the local study model they can use for their local area study, reliability studies, but they also have a general representation of the dynamic behavior of that plant they could put in the interconnection-wide models. And then the third step is uh, the EMT models, electromagnetic transient models, um, and, and those are really needed in, in any situation where there may be a, a weak grid condition or a low short circuit strength condition uh, where more advanced modeling capability, uh, you know, three-phase modeling, point of wave modeling is really uh, enabled in those types of tools. And so in those situations, you, it's better to be safe than sorry from a reliability standpoint to go out and require those models be provided under any potential weak grid condition, and then also be able to do the benchmarking there as well to say, well, does that EMT model, which is the actual representation of that plant, match at all the, the de detailed positive sequence model as well as the generic positive te sequence model, and they should match to some degree. They may not be exact, but we should have good confidence that, that the, those models match across the board. So that's really the perspective that's coming out of, out of NERC. It's a, really a three-tiered approach between generic user or black box kind of manufacturer model and then the EMT type models. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Ryan and Bob, for sharing that. I, there's another um, set of questions around um, something you mentioned, Ryan, briefly, uh, which is the uh, short circuit level or, or weak system integration. So there's a couple of questions, and I'll read one of them around short circuit level. And it's a, uh, pointed out here, it's a critical parameter for power electronic systems such as wind turbines. Does NERC, do the NERC guidelines include requirements to verify model performance for a range of short circuit levels? And, and obviously the lowest short circuit level is usually the critical criteria. And also looking at control interaction as well. How, how, how do we deal with that going forward? Yeah, so that, uh, in terms of a requirement standpoint from a, you know, maybe a standards perspective, there really is no re requirement to verify performance under a specific short circuit level. Um, but we do have a reliability guideline that, that hopefully will be approved very shortly, or was approved actually, um, recently looking at interconnecting resources to weak grids and, and what, what the recommended steps are in that process. And really that, that coordination is at the, you know, the planning coordinator, transmission planner, GEO, working closely with the manufacturer 
to understand what are the expected short circuit levels that that particular interconnection may experience or that plant may experience at that interconnection. And then to be able to, you know, run those short circuit type metrics, provide kind of a reasonable expectation of where that plant could be, and then work closely with the manufacturer to make sure that the controls and everything are, are there to be able to handle that short circuit strength. Really the requirements on modeling are, are more generic and that your model is expected to match the overall plant, plant uh, behavior. Uh, regardless of, of the condition in, in which it's, it sees. And so that, that's, that presents its own challenge. But uh, the short circuit aspects really happen at the level below NERC, which is the plant planners interacting with the geo, interacting with the manufacturer. Uh, I'd just add to that, Jason, that um, there's another facet to the low short circuit level. <clears throat> and it's not necessarily the behavior of the actual equipment uh, <clears throat> with a weak interconnection. It's whether... Uh, the, the model itself is actually stable under those conditions um, because we see, uh, you know, existing plants today that can operate with a short circuit ratio south of one under a contingency. And, uh, you know, it's likely that, you know, the positive sequence model under those conditions won't be stable. It, in, in fact, it might be the case that if you try to use <clears throat> synchronous machine excitation and governor model from the dynamic library it wouldn't work under those interconnect conditions anyway. So uh, Ryan mentioned the EMTT mo or EMT models and sometimes those are required simply because we we don't have a suitable uh, platform for analyzing those extremely low uh, short circuit uh, ratios. Right. Yeah, great answers. And I think, uh, Ryan, you, you alluded to um, some of the work that uh, has been done all, already with NERC around the, um, uh, the guideline that was created some time ago for weak system interconnection and modeling. And I think that's a great way to, to learn a lot more about that subject. And, um, you know, having that available is very helpful to the industry. We have a couple minutes left. I think uh, let's wrap up with one more quick question, uh, and uh, we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, so this one is an insightful question, I think as a short answer. It says, with sudden changes to inverter terminal voltage uh, during grid faults, the power, uh, power plant controller is essentially bypassed and turbines respond immediately with internal control loops. Wouldn't verifying the performance of the individual inverter level give insight to large disturbances instead of just the plant level? I, well, I think under those conditions where the, the power plant controller is obviously slower and you have autonomous response of the individual turbines or inverters, um, you know, to a grid disturbance, uh, if you have the appropriate measurement data, that would tell you something about the, uh, about the turbine or the inverter, you know, all by itself. Uh, I think the, the real issue is, is having the appropriate measurement data so you can, um, you know, translate to terminal conditions for the, the turbine or the inverter. Right. Yeah, and I think, that, I think that's a really good question because that's exactly what we're dealing with in the RPTF. From a validation standpoint, I think the standards are fairly clear. Uh, the standards are performance-based standards, so they are not equipment standards. And so we don't specify how something needs to be done. Really what we specify is just what needs to be done. And so the concept of validation applies. It doesn't matter really what type of disturbance it is. You need a model that accurately represents reality and it's up to the GO and the working with their manufacturer to ensure that the model does, does represent that. And so it's not prescriptive on the types of tests or exactly what needs to be done from a testing perspective, but the model does need to match. So yeah, inverter, inverter level testing it is, is great. Uh, it's just not necessarily something that can be you know, dictated or prescribed in a reliability standard, but exactly that question is, is the, the root of most of the, the grid events that we're seeing which is where that outer loop plant level controller, you know, essentially stops, you know, the inverters stop responding to that and they take over control because they're seeing a very low voltage, for example. So below some threshold, they're going to go into a, a faster voltage control loop instead of the outer loop plant level controls. And that transition and how the inverter responds and then gives handoff back and how all these control modes interact with each other are the things that need to be accurately modeled. And I'm not sure we're there yet. I'm not sure that the a NERC standard is going to directly address it, but the guidance that under, you know, like the NERC IRPTF guidelines that we're putting together will hopefully provide some guidance for that, for that specific issue. Great. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I uh, really appreciate uh, 
um, all the answers, and uh, some of those were some tough questions, and I think you guys did a great job at answering them. Uh, so, okay, we're at the top of the hour, so we're going to need to wrap it up. Uh, and again, this session is being recorded, and an email will go out once the presentations and audio files have been posted. I'd really like to thank Bob and Ryan for their comprehensive presentations, uh, and also to everyone that submitted questions. I think we had a, a really great session, a really great interaction. And um, if you didn't get your question answered, there were certainly more here than we had time to get to. Please send it to info at uvig.org, and we will respond to you as soon as possible. I'd also like to thank all of you for joining this session. We really appreciate all your engagement and really look forward to seeing you at our next webinar given by NREL on Thursday, December 14th, providing an update on renewable energy integration. Please stay tuned for more details and go to the UVIG website uh, to learn more. Thank you, everyone. Great discussion.